It's so walkable. How are we all this morning? You're going first. Yay! 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 <laughs> so I think the, the are we awake? Yay! A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, welcome back, everybody, um, to this opening discussion of the 2014 World Fringe Congress. It's lovely to see you all here. Yeah. Come in, come in, come in. Um, so for the rest of the day, most of the discussions are going to be more breakout and more discursive, but we thought it was good to get you all together at the start of the day um, to, to hear some thoughts from our panelists and then to um, get your mind into the discussions that we're going to be having at the Congress. It's great that you're all here. Um, as we said yesterday, you've come from all over the world, 15 countries, 39 festivals, there are 58 of you, and we're very, very delighted to be hosting the second World Fringe Congress here in 2014. I'd like to thank our partners, the City of Edinburgh Council, Creative Scotland, Event Scotland, and of course the British Council, which leads me on to introducing um, the chair for this panel discussion. We uh, work a lot with the British Council um, at the Fringe here in Edinburgh and the other Edinburgh festivals. They're very supportive of the international work that we do. They're very supportive of this Congress, and I'm absolutely delighted that Graham Sheffield, who's Director of Arts for the British Council, um, is going to chair this panel discussion. Graham has a long association with the Fringe uh, since he directed an opera here when he was a student. Yeah. Next door. Next door. <laughs> in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, Graham has a long uh, and illustrious arts career. He ran the Barbican for a while and now is um, Director of Arts for the whole of the British Council. So we're absolutely delighted that he's here to chair this panel. I'll get the rest of the panellists to introduce themselves. But this 2014 World Fringe Congress is Fringe the New Me. Over to you, Graham. Thank you, Kat. It's, it's very good. Thank you, Kat. Um, it's, it's, it's very good to be back. And it's the first time I've ever been invited back by popular demand. So, <laughs> so, so, so. this is a very unfringe venue, actually, isn't it? It's very, very comfortable. <laughs> so, um, so good morning, everybody, and I have my welcome to you from, from, from obviously from the Congress, but also from my perspective of the British Council. It's great to see so many international people here once again, and um, I'm having a pretty full-on week. I don't trouble is with my job now. I have to meet so many delegations. It's probably a bit like Kathy. You don't get time to see as many shows as you'd like to, but anyway, I'm doing my best. Um, the format, what we're going to try and do today, because the, the question is completely unanswerable, as you will already have worked out, um, but we don't actually have to answer any questions in this session. We can just have a nice chat, and then you can go away and do the real work in the breakouts and answer all the questions. So it's going to be fairly informal. We're, we're, we've got some, um, I'm, I'm amazed, all sort of, I'm referring to you as a single unit. All four <laughs> panellists have done uh, their homework, so they'll pose, I think, some provocations, and uh, we may break up the session because Lauren has done a very, very rigorous and sort of, sort of nicely fascistic sort of <laughs> running order. <laughs> but we might try and play with that a bit. Um, so if you want to say something at any point, just, just, um, uh, just indicate and we'll get a microphone to you. I'll try and keep some semblance of order, but really want to make this more of a conversation. So um, I think it's, it's good, it's, it should be an interesting discussion because the, you know, there's so much. Uh, fringe means so much to so many people and so does mainstream. So that's why the two words are almost indefinable now and have become just sort of catch-alls for whatever people want to make them, them mean. And I think everybody is now sort of grappling with questions about quality, about commercialization, about, I suppose, access as well as an issue, programming, pricing, all these things. And so what can we, what can we learn from one another by best practice? Because I think that's obviously what the, the underlying theme of this is. And, and so much of the fringe now has become quite posh, actually. I mean, I was picking up, was playing with this one. This, this one from Chris here is pretty, pretty posh. But I think even Chris in Dublin is, is, is trumped by this sort of mega book from the, <laughs> from the summer hall, which A, is very, very smart, and B, smells amazing. We've been passing it around from smell. This really smells expensive. And I don't know whether anybody sort of can try. That probably wins the, yes, the best smelly brochure <laughs> award um, and you know it's changed it's changed so much I mean this is extraordinary that, that the kind of 
organisation of that is very far from the, what the Fringe started from, as, as you know. Anyway, it's enough for me to, to begin with. Um, uh, I, we've got, um, I'm going to get each of the, the panellists to introduce themselves very briefly, because that's more interesting than me telling you what they are, who they are. So just from round the table, East mm. End Cabaret. Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm Jen. And I'm Vicky. And together we are East End Cabaret. Um, <laughs> essentially we're a double act and we tour around the world to different fringes with mm. our show. So Just we here. are here to give the artist's perspective uh, on the questions. Yeah. Oh. Is that enough? Chris, you go. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Chris Nelson. I'm the director of Tiger Dublin Fringe, uh, which is, we're having our 20th year this year. Uh, we're one of the world's few entirely curated fringes, uh, and it's my first edition. I moved from Montreal in September, so it's been a year. Hi, I'm Cynthia Wen from Taipei Fringe, and uh, I also like manage. Uh, uh, Taipei Fringe is an open access fringe, but we, uh, my office, we also uh, manage to run the Taipei Arts Festival and Taipei Children's Arts Festival, which are curated. So it's my 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 my. My role is uh, kind of different, yeah. But you seem to run every festival in yeah. Taipei. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So we'll come on to that. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah. You're yeah. a good person to know. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm Julianne. I'm from Washington, DC. I'm the CEO and founder of Capital Fringe. We do a summer fringe festival that has about 140 productions in about 15 venues over 18 days. And then over the, we're going into our 10th year, and over the 10 years we've started doing more and more year-round programming, and we're just going through the process of purchasing a building and opening up an art facility. So you're becoming an institution wow. then? Oh, I yeah. guess, yeah. It's part of the conversation. <laughs> okay. Well, already some questions there uh, uh, from, from the introduction, so let's, let's kick off. Unseasonably early for you. My God. For you, Cabaret. Uh, yeah, so. you don't often see us out before noon. <laughs> so that's why we look a little weird. <laughs> By so the way. You're, you're here to just answer the or try and answer the question what does fringe and mainstream mean to an artist? Mm. Well, basically, we. Um, We've been doing this now for about four years and we essentially do a lot of touring to different fringes and that's how we make our living. Um, we started on the Free Fringe in Edinburgh about four years ago yeah. in the Counting House um, in a tiny room above a pub and it was amazing. We had an amazing year. Um, you know, we were, by the end on the last night, I think we had over 200 people queuing out the door trying to get in, but mm. they couldn't physically fit in the room. Um, Health and safety was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we had such a great time that we thought, my God, what is this fringe thing? This is amazing. We want to do this all the time. Then we went to Australia and we um, did the Adelaide Fringe, which is our first other fringe aside from Edinburgh, um, which was a very different beast. We were in the Garden of Unearthly Delights, which is an amazing venue. And our venue had a $37,000 guarantee. So we were like, whoa, our director, producer didn't tell us this at the time. So he was <laughs> freaking out every yeah. night. And we were sort of blissfully unaware of the yeah. whole situation. Um, but again, we had an amazing time in Adelaide. Um, and then this year we've done Perth uh, Fringe as well and Melbourne Comedy Festival as well. Um, and we're back in Edinburgh. Um, so comparing, we've also done Brighton as well, which is a great fringe. Mm. Um, but all the different fringes have different atmospheres and different things that can be gained, I think, from them. Like, I think it's always important to know why you're doing each fringe. Um, in terms of mainstream, I think that's the beauty of fringe is that you can find so many different experiences within it. Like Edinburgh, for example, is now so huge that you have something like Summer Hall, which is this, you know, kind of a bit more exclusive, a bit more upmarket, but you also have the free fringe where you can go and go into a phone box and have one person perform a show at you for an hour, mm. um, you know, and it's just incredible the amount of variety that there is. Exactly, yeah. It's, I mean, the idea of it being mainstream, like from an artist's perspective anyway, uh, it's kind of a choice of, like Jim was saying, like why you're here and where you see yourself, I guess, within the kind of fringe world. Um, whether or not we see ourselves as the mainstream is kind of like, it, it is, it's kind of from where your perspective is because by choosing to be a fringe performer in the first place, 
you have kind of issued the mainstream slightly. Um, you know that your audiences are looking for something a little bit different from sitting in front of the TV on a Sunday night. Which um, is good. Which is good. <laughs> and you know that um, the venues generally, because fringes pop up anywhere, uh, you know that they're going to be slightly less than uh, mainstream as well. So, you know, there's all sorts of issues that you have to deal with there. And also artists that want to work in fringe festivals, they generally think a bit more uh, alternatively anyway, even if they're looking to get a wide audience. Marketing and uh, promotion and just the way of sort of getting out there is very, it can be very alternative as well. I mean, when we first started, sorry, I'm so husky because <laughs> it's, early. <laughs> um, it's very, very attractive. Sexy. It's okay. very attractive. Good. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm going for, people. Um, but when we first started here, uh, we started using these little uh, moustaches. If you don't know, um, I usually dress as a half man, half woman, so it's very lucky don't that you actually get to see me as a full woman today, <laughs> which is exciting. Um, but uh, when we were on the Free Fringe, we realised that to stand out from the myriad of shows that there were on the free fringe, let alone on the paid fringe as well. We needed to get out there and do something a little bit more, uh, less than mainstream, rather. So we made these by hand. Uh, oh yeah. We glued them and stamped our little uh, yeah. thing on the back. Takes hours. We made 3,000 of them. <laughs> and, and then we hand them out and we and, uh, get people to take pictures with them and all sorts of things like that. And it's a much more effective way of getting people into the shows um, than flyering, but also obviously we fly them as well so they know where they're going. But, um, but I think that's also the beauty of it, like instead of a big festival, where you might have international companies that no one ever comes into contact with, infringes, mm. it can be a lot more personal, you know? Yeah. You're out there and you're meeting people, and like we fly still now, um, yeah. and you know, people just love interacting with the performers, and, and you know, we really care about it, it's our show, and if people don't come, we don't eat, so yeah. you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> it, you get that feeling much more, and that personal connection from which it. I think which fringe is, audiences really, really respond to, you know? Like as much as people are, up for seeing whatever you know the big new international hot show is part of being a fringe audience is wanting to see something that's kind of out of the mainstream it's coming to your town like if whether you live there whether you're traveling in to see something a bit special you know like those three like rules of seeing something at the fringe kind of are there for any kind of uh, fringe festival. So you see something that's big, you see something that's a little bit independent that you've kind of heard of, and then there's a wild card that you just go for, you know, and see mm. what you can, what you find. You might find something awful, you might <laughs> find something amazing. Either way, it'll be an alternative experience, I suppose. So just, I think by definition, you know, we are a little bit more uh, alternative rather than mainstream. Um, and especially like compared to our other work, because uh, we do do a lot of festivals, but we don't do them every single week of the year. Uh, when we live in London, like that would we be would exhausting. Die. Yeah. We would die. Um, uh, when we're back home in London, we actually are like artists that do have a base, which is unusual for fringe artists. Um, we do a lot of uh, hosting and variety shows. We do a lot of uh, like a little bit of corporate stuff, and even that that choice from going from that to a fringe festival makes us a little bit more like uh, alternative rather than mainstream, I suppose. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Shall I pause you there? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Pause button. Yes. <laughs> no, that was very good. Excellent. There are a lot of interesting words, words there, but you seem as though you're sort of comfortable in this environment. You don't aspire in a sort of old-fashioned hierarchical way to kind of go and be something else. I think there is still uh, an aspiration. Be respected. Exactly. Well, I mean, hopefully a little bit after four years-ish. Uh, I mean, there's people that have been doing it, obviously, for mm. far, far longer than we have. Um, but even in an alternative, there's still a hierarchy. You know? yeah. Like, then there's still... A, we we want to get as many people in as we can. So mm. whether we don't want to perform to three people or whatever the average is, generally, of fringe audiences. We want to get everybody in. So... As much as we do say that we're alternative, an alternative option, we still want to attract mm. those audiences. So it's kind of a balancing act, mm. you know, making sure that the way you promote your show and how you want to bring the audiences in and what audiences you want to bring in. Like, the people we want are going to be very different to the people that are going to a classical concert at well, some point. I don't hall. know. I, I might do both. There is crossover. I'm not normal, though. You <laughs> That's fair. Well, I mean, yeah. fringe audiences yeah. generally aren't. 
crazy normal. But yeah, um, then people who want to see certain genres of performance uh, like may not want to see others. But then people at fringes hopefully would be open minded enough to yeah. want to see say the top sort of you know stand up acts at the stand or wherever as well as something that's a little bit more you know different. Yeah. No, thanks. I, 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 uh, I think it's interesting. I've heard one presenter on the fringe say, "Oh, I need for a show that isn't doing very well. Uh, I need some of that international audience, you know." So and mm -hmm. he's not getting it. Um, yeah, I like the point you made about contact. And I, I went to, to the again at Summer Hall. It's not a plug for Summer Hall. <laughs> I, I went to um, yes, it is. No, it is. <laughs> I, I went to the Gallic Macbeth actually yesterday, which was uh, quite interesting. A, it was interrupted by a fire alarm. <laughs> so, so they had to pause it and then come back. And then I went outside for a very good gin and tonic they do in that tent. And uh, Macbeth came round handing out flyers. So that's absolutely, you've just seen him. Yeah. But you're probably more likely to want to go and see him. Yeah, that absolutely. You have no, it's a serious met point. Yeah. Macbeth, mm. and this is the thing. Yeah. It is okay. it's a nice thing. Thank you. A number of issues there we'll come back to. So, um, Cynthia. Oh, yeah. A very different, whoops, yeah. my, my microphone just fall out. Very different kind of uh, organization in Taipei, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. And as yeah. you, I've got lots of questions even before hearing your presentation. Mm. Yes. Uh, which is, you know, how do you decide which festival you're going to put the act in? You know, yeah. so anyway, off okay. you go with your, your presentation. Yes, thank you. I saw everybody uh, has PowerPoint, but anyway, I made my PowerPoint, so... I think it's going to be right behind us. Yes, you have to turn. Should we dim the light? Okay. I think it's okay, actually. Yeah. It's only for any so, five slides, uh, I think. This is Taipei Fringe. Uh, I, I put the Taipei view because uh, I don't know if, if anyone knows Taipei. It's uh, in Taiwan and it's about like a, a very close to mainland China and its a population is about 23,000 million people. And Taipei is the most uh, cultural things happening. And the Taipei Fringe, we are an, a jewelry and a filtered art festival. And so the, it is uh, the fastest growing art festival in Taiwan. And so here you can see that uh, we have a different, like, uh, different venues. And our organi organization is kind of different because we are sponsor of our organization uh, founded totally by uh, Taipei City government. So actually you can say that it's not uh, from uh, like an artist spontaneously founded a fresh fringe. It is uh, like uh, by the city government. And we are the Taipei Cultural Foundation, and which we organize uh, three different festivals. But the uh, Taipei Fringe is uh, uh, first year is 2008, so it's on seven years. And so our our spirit is just like maybe it's, it, our spirit is like freedom, openness, and maturity, and initiative. It's so it's now jewelry and the venue. I think it's different <coughs> because we search for the menus for the artists to use for free. So that's my. That's my, my, my question right now because uh, we have uh, so many difficulty uh, in the artists using the venues and also we have to organize the venues. But anyway, uh, the fringe is a very new thing in Taipei and it's also uh, opened a new area for the young artists. Our girls, uh, the, the, for the seven years, but it, I don't know, in compared to other fringe, I think we, my, my size are still kind of very, very little. Uh, this year we have like uh, one, 130 group and the total performance is 543. Uh, the venue we use is 34. So compared to the size, it's not uh, big, but in Taipei it's quite big uh, uh, right now. And, but uh, what we are like 50, uh, our, <coughs> our artists like 50% get invitation from other festivals. That's, uh, so I cannot say that's a mainstream, but that's a, a place to discover new talent. And 80% of the people, they continue their new performance. So it's good that we encourage people. And 30% return artists. So that's, uh, that, that means we have uh, some of the artists, they just like fringe. They don't not really like to go to the other like big festival or something, but they will come to us. So uh, over the seven years, we have like uh, over 500 new groups discovered and over uh, 100 new value, uh, venues explored. 
and inspire over 200 new critics because in, in the like seven years ago, there are not really so many critics. But we think that uh, uh, critic is very important uh, comment from the uh, expert. That's why we also like uh, model the Edinburgh Fringe and then we, we, we had uh, some uh, critics and some awards. So my final presentation, uh, my question and challenge before we can become mainstream because our regulation of the temporary venue usage because uh, as I say that we have to serve for the venues and some of the venues, uh, the, the regulation for the theater use in Taipei is still not uh, very quite complete. So that's why I have so many difficulties in like finding new men venues and uh, get permitted. So that's my question right now. And I don't know if before that issue being, uh, being like uh, completed or I can like the tapping fridge will ever be growing ever bigger or something. And the other question is like a uh, free venue for the artist and <laughs> so the artist becomes spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> so another question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you can use the venue for free, why? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> so it's, and the other, it's a wrong, it's box office, it's box return. Uh, yeah, important to artists because uh, we, we think that uh, because uh, the artists in Taipei Fringe, they cannot uh, get funded by the Taipei City uh, government. So we think that uh, they should all sell tickets. But, <clears throat> but as I see in, uh, in Edinburgh Fringe here, and so many people, they would just uh, rather do like free, free uh, Fringe. And they, they just want people to see. So maybe that's another way for us to, to see uh, uh, our Fringe. So and another question is international and friendly regulation. It's in Taiwan. So uh, for any like uh, foreign uh, performers, they want to perform in Taiwan. There's uh, so many difficulties. Uh, so we have we have tried our best to help them. But in order to attract more people uh, from like because we are a Chinese uh, like Mandarin speaking uh, country. So if we want to attract more more people like uh, maybe in Hong Kong, mainland China, and also mm. in Macau, there's still some not not very friendly like uh, situation. So anyway, <laughs> so that's my question. And the funding or private sponsorship. I, I don't know if it happens to other fringe because uh, fringe. Uh, because of fringe that no one knows that what's the performance going to happen. So it's kind of very difficult for us to get funding because the corporate, they didn't like to fund that uh, ensure things. So that's, and government, uh, government and state rules, that's, that's my question because we are uh, organized, my, my, my boss is the Taipei Cultural uh, Bureau. So sometimes they just have to say, no, this performance is uh, too, too weird for us, or this performance is not good. But anyway, for us, it is good. Is it all right? It, it is, it, the fringe should have this kind of performance. So that's, uh, that's uh, we are struggling with, uh, also with this. But uh, they, they kind of respect us. But in the meantime, that the, the communication is kind of painful. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, that's, that's my yeah. That's my presentation. Thank you. No, can, yeah. Yes, can, Thank you. Uh, 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 yes, can you could you just leave the last slide up actually? Oh there, my God. There, really? There, yeah. You said, yeah. Because those are the other one. The questions. No, the questions. Yeah. 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 Because I just thought those were quite <laughs> rather interesting. I mean, it does beg a, a question. I mean, are there some artists who are coming that are and actually uncomfortable about the, the kind of formality of the cultural, the, the right. political yeah, yeah, framework yeah. in which yeah. they're presented. And do they want to go out and do what some artists have done here? Barche, Kath, everybody would want to be in Kath's friends, but do a free fringe or do a splinter mm. thing. Do people try and do that? Is that possible? Yeah, some people, they, they try to do that. But because our regulation right now is that you have to sell tickets. So that's... Uh, I, oh, you I, have to sell tickets. Yeah, you have to sell tickets. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so maybe that... Uh, well, they could sell <laughs> tickets, but for free, couldn't they? They could sell tickets for no money. Some people try to do that, and mm. then we say, no, you have to sell tickets. <laughs> anyway, so... And so what are these, some of these difficult discussions with government? Is it about, you know, if, if these people turned out to do their disgusting show, would they be able to be on your... Would they be able to be on your... Uh, uh, I think discussing is or uh, dis discussing is all right, <laughs> but maybe it's something like uh, uh, nudity or partial nudity or like uh, 
I don't know. They have an issue about that, and beca because uh, the the people like they 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 complain to the city government, and city government would say, no, Cynthia, how about this program? Uh, I don't think that's good. Or like a reporter, they they like to like uh, to dig in the the French program, and then to see, oh, this one has a uh, nudity or something. That that's my my question. Yeah. Because the nature of French is obviously it's always pushing pushing the boundaries. Yes. So, yes. so does that lead to a certain sort of safeness in the programming. Right, program. right. But because I don't know, because my boss is the Taipei City government, I don't know if that uh, uh, to get the funding, then we have to go through certain rules. And then the also, yeah. Can I just ask, is, mm. it, is, it, is it getting better? Are the, are the government more comfortable with some of the program now in 14 than they were in 2008? I mean, are they, are they becoming more open? Uh, it depends on the people. Yeah, it depends on the maybe the commissioner. They uh, he's very supportive. <laughs> then we are fine. If the commissioner is kind of like not to taking taking responsibility, then we have to. So it depends. Yeah. So yeah, and we'll come back to to that. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So you haven't been to the Taipei Fringe? No, yet. no, we haven't. <laughs> I'm curious now. I will help you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, we'll all be there the first night in Taipei. See if the government shuts really it down. The yeah. first night show to be closed down. Yeah. Um, so Chris, uh, why don't you just go straight in because sure you've done thing. your introduction, and um, we'll come back to some of the points. You may have some observations on the others so far, I don't know. Yeah, what I would say is, um, uh, like, we have a lot of the same sort of questions that Cynthia would have around uh, what, what, what the, um, how to keep the kind of experimental spirit of the festival or the, the wild spirit of the festival or the spectacular spirit of the festival, uh, and then, and also, uh, be legitimate enough, I guess, for 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 funders and sponsors. The, the the context in Dublin is really really interesting. I think, in that, in its twenty years, uh, through all the hard work of the artists and the the people who've directed the festival, uh, the Dublin Fringe has become, unlike a lot of the fringes I know, in a sense, it, it has this sort of. Uh, um, reputation for, or a, a, like a history of pushing really, really, really uh, artistically valid, like high, high, high quality artistic work. So it does have that kind of boutique thing to it. It also has had a, like a long history with the Spiegel tent and, and a long history with stand up comedy and re like the real sort of rough and ready things about Fringe. It's this sort of, it lives in this kind of interesting uh, hybrid tension between. Uh, I guess the mainstream or populist ideas and populist work and the avant-garde and the experimental. So the, the kind of push and pull around the festival or like one of the things since coming to Dublin that I've loved is hearing people describe the art scene in, in, in Dublin and talk about the three major festivals. Well, you know, there's the Dublin Theatre Festival, it's like this amazing international theatre festival and where you see all the leading Irish companies. And then there's the Dublin Dance Festival, which is in its 10th year, and, and it's like mm -hmm. trying to make the mission of bringing dance to, uh, to dance, dan like enlivening the dance audience in Ireland. And then they get to Fringe and they go, and then there's the Dublin Fringe and they go, they have this kind of hiccup where they can't really pinpoint what the aesthetic is. And they can't really pinpoint what, like, it's that fringe thing. It's the, it, you know, and then they might go into the list of like, well, it's cabaret, it's, it's circus, it's comedy, it's theater. It's also where you can see leading Irish artists. Uh, it's also where you can see like the new, the, the new voices of, the, of, of all of those disciplines, as well as the, the, some of the legends, because they'll come back and they go between the different festivals. Uh, and where the festival sort of sits, I think, in the in the hearts of of the audience, is very, 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 in this like really vital central position. So I've never felt, uh, you know, and I'm Canadian. In the, in the Canadian context, depending on the city you're in, the the, the fringe can be like a uh, like it, it can be kind of way on the outskirts of sort of legit legitimacy or artistic interest. Or it can be right in the heart. Like if you're in a city like Edmonton, it's right in driving the kind of artistic thing of the city. And other cities uh, like Montreal, for, for example, it's just it's not in the same uh, in, in terms of the press and all that. It's not in the same world. So in, in Dublin, you've never so forgive me for interrupting. Yeah. So in Dublin, you've never felt the need to define it further. And indeed, that slightly 
the pause you're well, describing I, I, people trying is, is almost the point. The, it? Well, the po and it's also the opportunity to talk about what it can be and what it what it is and how that shifts. Uh, so, and, and that shifts under the sort of as the as. Ireland experiences different things and as the artists are driving it's like it's a very much an artist led festival so uh, as the artists uh, projects and positions on things kind of change like in the last five years Ireland was going through its enormous economic crisis and all these revelations around the church and like like lots and lots of things issues that needed to be dealt with in the civic sphere and that was at play in the festival uh, and before there was, you know, this kind of the heyday of the tiger and the, Spie the Celtic tiger and the Spiegel tent and like the party was alive, I guess. But there is something, I mean, we, we, we are kind of mainstream in a sense. We're, we're the biggest festival in the city, the biggest interdisciplinary festival in the city. We have funding on all levels of government. We have a title sponsor, which is Tiger Beer. Uh, the, the process of explaining what the festival is is like in, in the that just happened this year so in the autumn when we were meeting with the marketing people and talking about what the festival was I remember this one you know you, you get into that room probably a lot of you have been there and you talk to like you're talking to like these brand managers and they're trying to find this way to, to match you with something and this one person said well I've been talking about fringe as a thing to be sponsored uh, with all the companies I work with like with the product like whatever the cosmetics or the pharmaceutical or the beer or whatever and they always go but it's too niche or it's too out there and I I kind of go well we have an audience of 35,000 people in Ireland that's a city like it's a town and that's not niche like that's a lot of different people with a lot of different tastes who are coming into the festival to have that fringe experience that beautiful magical uh, telephone booth or high art experience or maybe both at the same time so there's there's this kind of I don't know the thing like thinking this this thinking through this whole question of like mainstream or, or off mainstream I mean we're right in the heart of the city where we take over the city for a month that's kind of mainstream the topics at play are mainstream in the sense that they're the things that people are talking about at the dinner table or in the pub there's also a lot of things in there that were uncovered that the artists are uncovering ideas provocations that are happening. There's mm. new forms that are happening and there's traditional forms that are happening. I think of it as this kind of like real push and pull between uh, between this sort of what's known and unknown, I guess. And and one of the things I think is exciting and this the kind of like mission I feel I have as a, a festival director is is to make this is to make the mainstream or to make the avant-garde popular mm. and to bring kind of a populist aesthetic into the into the avant-garde like well, how can those two how can those two very often very seemingly oppositional sides of the artistic coin how can they kind of meet and where can they meet why why aren't the international festivals as it were trying to do that because that's what i was always trying to do is make the avant-garde yeah. popular i'm really interested to hear you 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 say that it should almost be every festival's mission, shouldn't it? In a sense, I think. But there's a, a the, and there's a thing about like, you know, could uh, an Irish artist working in the avant-garde become an international superstar or someone who was known in every ta around every dinner table in in the country? That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. As well as you know, it's like a, a Camille O'Sullivan, for example, who's yeah. been with Fringe. Like she'll she she's coming back to the festival this year to celebrate her 20 years of performing at the Fringe. Like, she started there, and now she's, like, she is a superstar. Right, yeah. But she's coming back, so there's this kind of, um, that's a yeah. question, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you are cu curated or not curated? I can't We're all curated. You're all curated. So the, the international work we invite in, like, a, like any kind of festival, we pay mm. the fee, we pay the, there's an arrangement mm. around the travel. Very rarely do the international artists come in on splits, unless they're sort of really fringe, uh, rough and ready, like re like ready to go, like mm. like an East End cabaret, for example. Uh, and then the Irish artists, most some of them we do, we do co-produce some work. Most of it is on a split. Uh, just to really quickly go through the model, we take care of the venue and and, and all the system, and then we do uh, a, a very healthy split towards the artists. And we also have a year-round uh, building called Fringe Lab. So there's two studios above our offices where artists use them pretty much 10 or 12 hours a day, uh, and we give a l hour, thousands and thousands of hours away for free due to an arts, w w thanks to an Arts Council grant. So we're in that, like, we have a building <laughs> as well, and we're, you know, and we're a little tiny team of four plus, so, you know, it's that thing of, 
being an institution and not, yeah. you know. I suppose it is symptomatic. Stuff. I suppose it is symptomatic a bit of the, the, the global economy in the sense that people are still required to take, want to take risks. We have to take risks. We have to be innovative. Uh, a lot of businesses are starting up as micro businesses mm -hmm. and so on. And, and I suppose in the same way, innovation is coming much more from the smaller. It's easier to take <laughs> risks yeah. on a smaller scale, whereas all these big institutions now. It's very hard to take a risk because you make a, a, a risk and you make one mistake yeah. and you're bankrupt. Yeah. Or you've had to raid your endowment if you're in the States or yeah. whatever. So there is that sort of crucible element which may be more organized but more rigorous now mm. in the smaller uh, fringe festivals than it's possible to be on a larger scale. I think so. And I think uh, there's, there's, there's also a really particular thing about Ireland and about Dublin, which is that the, it's like it's a big city. But it's also it also has this sort of incredibly interwoven, interlinked small town kind of feel. And Ireland's a big country, but also at the same time, uh, you can, hard work can make a very large national impact. And that's across the arts, but also in design and in restaurant restauranting. And, and so there's this kind of uh, the impact that that you can have is quite significant. The access that you can have, like uh, like for example. To, to land a title sponsor was was very difficult, but it was an and a, a process and a kind of courtship and around different like, do you want us to change our, who we are? We won't. So we had to kind of date before we found the right match. Um, but that feels somehow more possible in a in a in an environment like Ireland than yeah. than others perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Is that all you want to say at the moment? Pretty yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Cool. Well, that sort of leads on neatly, I think, to Julianne. I was going to sort of say, uh, you know, nowhere could be more different than Dub from Dublin than Washington, D.C. Uh, in some ways, and you're going to tell me I'm completely wrong because I haven't been there for some time, uh, Washington is the sort of place that you'd least imagine to have a sort of flourishing fringe. But that's my out-of-date uh, prejudice, and you're going to tell me I'm completely wrong, and it's a really hip place to have a... And I'm really excited to welcome you there. And like to <laughs> <laughs> I'm going there in two weeks' time, yeah, so yes. <laughs> Uh, hi. Uh, I, I first just want to say that Alex, who's our program manager, and Peter, who's our COO, are also here. So if you want to talk about DC Fringe with them, you can talk with them. I just don't want to forget. Uh, so I just want to tell you a little bit of our history, because I think mm. that'll sort of help you have some context into who we are. Um, so I'm the founder, so it means that I like know too much information about it. <laughs> uh, so I moved to DC in December of 2003, and it was super dead. Um, it was right when, this, when the town was still going through like a lot of uh, rebuilding. Um, it, this, a lot of the city was destroyed in the 1968 riots when Martin Luther King died, and really just started getting rebuilt in the beginning of the 2000s. Um, so I moved there, and I'd lived in Philly for about three years, and the fringe there was really fun, and I always worked it, and I didn't, I don't know, I was really naive. I just thought every city was kind of the same, and I got there, and it was just sad. It was dark at night, everyone was wearing suits, because about, mm -hmm. you know, like, everyone sort of works for the federal government there, because mm -hmm. that's the biggest industry. Um, <coughs> and then I just, I don't know, I, about a year in, I decided the problem was that there wasn't a fringe festival. And then, because <laughs> uh, it was very hard to meet people. Um, and when I had worked in, at the Philly Fringe, it was how I met everybody that I knew, and I still know to this day. Um, so a couple friends, we just started talking about it, and the whole thing snowballed. And before we knew it, uh, we were having our first festival. In the first festival, we had about 96 groups. We thought it would be super cool to have 50. Um, and yeah, it was crazy. Um, so now we're going into our 10th year and not only have we, have we grown, but our city has grown as well, um, by leaps and bounds as far as population is concerned. Um, probably two years in, yeah, two years in, we got a building. Um, we got a 22,000 square foot area. I don't know that in whatever, I'm American, um, so. How big is that? Big? <laughs> uh, so we got um, a building which we, was sort of, it's a vacant building. Basically, we're, we have been squatting in it since 2008. In there, we've built three theaters, sort of started running a bar. Um, pay, we pay $5,000 a month for that space, but we are getting kicked out as long as the whole block is getting torn down for 
I guess you could call, you know, economic development, which was sort of what I was tasked to, to talk, talk about. about. So the economic yeah. regeneration is, is destroying your home, is it? Is well, so when we first moved into that neighborhood, which is where the festival started, which could be considered downtown, um, it's like a few, a couple blocks off of downtown. It was, you know, once it got past midnight, especially like one to four in the morning, it was mainly prostitutes and that kind of stuff going on on the street. Um, now it's like condos and there's a Safeway, which is a grocery store. Uh, so people are walking around with like shopping bags and stuff like that. So it's changed a lot. And, you know, when we were in there, cause I didn't, I mean, I went to school for theater, so I wasn't like a business person. So I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, people would say, wow, the French has really changed this community, this neighborhood. And I'd be like, whatever, we're just here. I don't know. But we really did. Like we actually really changed that neighborhood. Um, and in the beginning, it was very important for us to be in a neighborhood that was completely accessible and was downtown. And it was like, we're there, we're right there with you. Like as far as the Verizon Center where like all the big shows go through and stuff. Well, now we're gonna move to, I guess what could kind of be considered a fringe neighborhood. <laughs> uh, it's not Metro accessible, which is the subway. Uh, and it's actually very much in a community where people have like porches and they sit out there at night and have conversations with each other like a real neighborhood. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so it's, it's, a little, it's a little different. Um, and it's kind of interesting because in the beginning and I would have never- a diverse community as well. Totally diverse, diverse community. It's, it's in what's called Trinidad, which I would have never thought we would be going to Trinidad. But uh, yeah, there's all, there's, yeah, I, I think, I don't know everything about it because I have to learn. I mean, hopefully we'll get in there in October. I still have some money to raise. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's white people, it's black people. It, it seems like it's people that have money to buy houses and then, you know, make them fancy. Um, and then it has people that have lived in the neighborhood for generations. Um, but I would have never, in the beginning, I would have never put us in a neighborhood like that because I felt like we had to prove ourselves, like we needed to be where everyone could get to us very easily. And now I, I think we are becoming much bigger and much more well-known and I think in a way it's gonna be really good for us to sort of shake things up and make people sort of redefine and rediscover what fringe is. Um, Cause very different than I think a lot of, we don't, we're not curated. We do one sort of curated program, which is a site specific program, but it's more to get in different types of art versus curating, which I think sometimes is a little bit of intuition and um, maybe attitude. Um, mm. So, yeah. No, go on. I was uh, I can ask you a question if you yeah, want. Yeah, I just. Uh, <laughs> I think it's DC is a very unique place. Mm. Um, one of the reasons I think Fringe is successful there is that there wasn't really before we started there wasn't really a, a landing space for that community. Um, everything's very fancy there. You have the Kennedy Center and all that stuff that you guys might know about. Um, but since we started, and we, you know, we're somewhat legitimate, uh, you know, we started our first year, our budget was about 300,000. It's now about 1.5 million. Um, so we're really into like being an organization <laughs> and giving services to our artists and audiences. But before us, there wasn't a lot of mid-level amateur theater happening and if it did it would kind of go by and stuff and so we've had companies that started in the first year and they've continued on and they they may not do the fringe anymore and they may do shows outside of the festival um, and that's kind of why we're, we're wanting to get a building and actually yeah. have spaces because there are very few spaces in DC that they can mm -hmm. rent and use that aren't like huge halls yeah. and I mean, I got to, uh, really interesting because I, I just wondering, given the, the kind of all the institutions you've got in, in Washington, the art galleries and the museums and, and so on, which I imagine are much the same as they were when I was there. I think I was there in the 90s, actually, late 90s. Um, do you have a relationship? I mean, here in Edinburgh, there's obviously this yeah, uh, festivals, Edinburgh, and every, everybody 
I'm sure there are disagreements. Everybody tries very hard to work together with the international yeah. and different mm. festivals. Do you have any yeah, relationship with those Washington big beasts or not? Been a, or do they regard you as an irritant? Well, it's been a real <laughs> it's been a real journey because in the beginning we were like, yes, we want to be on the same level as you. And then like the third year in, uh, we actually didn't allow people, like we didn't allow regional theaters to take part in the festival because a lot of what they were doing was using it as they would just take like their season show and put it in and like they're just using us as like marketing and then they start using our name and I just thought it wasn't very genuine. I thought it was, and I didn't think it was fair to the other artists. They don't have marketing departments because I really try to keep a pretty level playing field for everybody so that it isn't, it isn't becoming like, I don't know, like whatever regional theater doing their stuff. So, but now it's like different. So, you know, everything always changes. Uh, so this year we let a regional theater mm. sort of be, come in the fold again. Um, but yes, we have relationships with mm. everybody. Shakespeare theater. You do. But I mean, do you, do you, are you noticed by the city in the, in the sense, the way the, the, uh, the fringe of Edinburgh notices? You can't, the city is small enough uh, it's, it's large yeah. enough to make an impact. It's small enough that you, you can't put something like this without being noticed by the city authorities. And are you a factor I feel like we're really, in, yes, in their we economic do. plan for the city? And, or, yeah, I mean, and right from like what you were talking about with the press mm -hmm. and how important that was, that was very important when we started was to make sure we got adequate press coverage. So, I don't know, we're in the post every single day of the festival. We're in mm. all the papers, all, you know. We try to be as loud and, you know, get it out there. So I would mm. say that we're completely noticed mm. and has, we've also like affected, I think, how people take into consideration things that might not be part of the mainstream uh, or what people would think is the mainstream. I don't even know what mainstream means, but um, easier accessible things like going to the Kennedy Center for a show and going to Woolly Mammoth for a show. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually become a place where audiences are generated and then they go and check. They, like, they may see theater or live performance for the first time because it's a cool place to hang out and, and it's not, not quite really so expensive. not quite so expensive um, and then check things out throughout yeah. the year. Yeah. So. And do you, one last question, and I'm going to come to uh, our guest here. Um, do, do you cover, because obviously in Dublin, I imagine you cover pretty much the whole city. I mean, you yes, yeah. a bit like here. Yeah. Yeah. Are you still very sort of um, like we've, an arrondissement in, in Washington? Are you just in one part of it? We've uh, tried a couple of different things, and I have found <clears throat> the best way to sell the most tickets <laughs> is to keep everything very concentrated so yeah. that because you're basically asking people to go to things they don't know anything about. And the way to do that, I think, is to make it so you can run from venue to venue and make all your decisions at the last minute. So we try to keep it, we usually have about 11 to 12 venues within like a three to four block radius so that everything can kind of. Yeah, yeah. so it's, you know. Because spreading it all over the place, it's so hard to get around and then yeah. Yeah. you can't make, you have to make like real decisions. What about in Taipei, you all over the city? It's all over the city. Well, all over the city, yeah. yeah, yeah Okay. And, and we would have like a central hub around Temple Bar and around the center of the city and then there's sort of like another little orbit and then there's the really far out stuff that might happen because it, it's happening at three in the morning or it's you know mm -hmm. like the special things that you have to travel to but it's the same yeah, yeah. I just got one, I have got one other question do you each of you and I come to ask you in the audience as well uh, do you still relate to do you still relate in many ways in some of your thinking back to the original fringe, which is here, like Edinburgh, is the sort of mother ship, or is it all much more molecular now that you look around the world for best practice models and so I on? And I think when we started, we used like the Edinburgh fringe language <laughs> to like legitimize ourselves and make it seem like what we did was familiar to people in some manner. Because mm -hmm. um, like, well, they do it over there and it's been going on a long time, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we don't do that at all. We don't do that at all. Because now it seems like people in our community, I think, are overly educated. And most of, a lot of our audience actually comes to Edinburgh to come to the festival. And so they're like, yay, we have it here. I mean, it's a smaller version, but we yeah. have it here. But I think, and I think if you actually look at, at people's websites and language, a lot of festivals that are first starting out use that language as a way to give context into mm. what it is, mm. just mm. to help define it in mm. some way. Mm.
Do you have any reactions as artists to these presentations? Yeah. That are very it's different actually, range, yeah, it's funny about that language thing because we've been at festivals, I mean, like this one that's been established for ages and then say it's something a little bit newer like Perth or uh, other like sort of smaller fringe festivals and it is kind of an educating of the audience as well for them to take those risks because it's kind of by definition a fringe festival is a bit more of a risk if you don't know what it is. You know, like if you've never been to a fringe festival before, you don't know what to expect. Like we had, where were we when that guy came? Perth. Perth when we, we were in Perth and uh, we were out flyering, as we do. And um, we had flyered this guy who said that he'd gone to a fringe performance, just a fringe performance. We didn't even know what it was. Four years ago, didn't like it. Never went to another French performance. Of any kind. Of any kind. <laughs> I don't even. That's what they all were. Anywhere <laughs> ever <person>. again. <laughs> like, because cause it was associated with French, and it seems outrageous to us because we know that French performances can be like a massive range of things, you know? And people that are established, people that are completely amateur, people that are doing it because they just want to get out there and are a little bit extroverted, people that have been doing it for years, but, whatever. Yeah, I think that's what, like, you made a really good point about mixing the mainstream with the feeling of new mm. and different and risky, because I think that's essentially what we try and do. Like, we started off as very fringe yeah but now kind like of. in australia we play you know 400 seat spiegel tents mm. and it is more it's mainstream much, yeah. you know and we try and like we're writing a, a you know a series for the bbc and you know we want to go mainstream mm. but also have that fringe mm. um i guess feeling of danger and excitement yeah. and yeah. difference it's almost a know? trick to the audience yes, it is a, trick. a little bit but yeah. it's not at all because we want them to feel like you know i mean the material that we are tackling is not necessarily mainstream and it is outrageous and it is a little bit poor, quite risque um, but but it's comedy ultimately exactly. and people uh, can relate to it and i think that's what fringe you know it is that hybrid of something mainstream mm. but also something different and yeah. you want people to have that feeling of fringe mm. but also it, it is quality and it is exactly. now you know there's so many different levels on mm. offer yeah um it's but you hope that that guy that sees a weird like one woman show in the back room of a pub also gives like something it. else a chance that goes okay you know maybe yeah it's worth it's, coming it's back kind of yeah having something that's marketable without jeopardizing the feeling that you're doing something a little bit dangerous. pushing boundaries yeah so who wants to to contribute from let's take sort of three or four points and then i'll put them to the Analyst, and we've got about 20 minutes, so it's quite relaxed. So don't, don't take up the whole 20 minutes. So you're, you're fine. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could just say who you are so that we can... Sure, my name is Donovan King and I'm with the Montreal Infringement Festival. So I have a sort of unique perspective in that, well, on the one hand, I'm a professional actor, so I do work a lot in the mainstream. But on the other hand, I also work on the infringement, which is based on the fringe of 1947. Uh, so I'm, I have my other foot sort of in that realm. And I, th I think it's a really interesting question, is the fringe the new mainstream? Because the mainstream is, you know, for an actor at least, you know, you go to work and you get paid. And uh, it's great, you know, I mean, that's how it works. <laughs> but at the fringe, uh, you know, originally it was just artists who were rebelling uh, because they were ex excluded from a festival. And so it's a bit of a different uh, type of thing. Now, I liked what Graham had to say in that he said the nature of the fringe is always pushing the boundaries. And I think that's true, at least originally that was the case. But my question is, uh, as we're seeing what's happening now, uh, what happens when corporations begin restricting the fringe's boundaries? And this is something we're seeing more and more. Or politicians. Um, well, I mean, for example, yeah. in Canada, the word fringe is trademarked. Uh, is they it? will actually sue you if you try to use it without their permission. They've done this before. Wow. Uh, so we can see it sort of moving in this direction, which to me isn't the mainstream. It's not, uh, okay, we're moving this towards actors getting paid for their work, but actually we're actually seeing actors paying. Uh, for example, on the Royal Mile, they're paying money to be um, advertising virgin money. I mean, it's all over the place. So I guess for me, the real question is, what's our role as administrators in terms of you know, empowering the artists or empowering the corporations? So I guess those, those are some of the issues that I'm just sort of kicking around in my head when we're thinking about the mainstream. Is it really the mainstream that we're going towards paying these actors properly? Or is it a different direction? And is it fair to call that the mainstream? 
And if that is the new mainstream, does that mean the professional actors will eventually not get paid as well? And we're seeing that on the internet and things like that too. So just yeah. thought I'd put that out there. Yeah, because you wouldn't you wouldn't treat any other uh, profession in that way, would you? And uh, you know, poorly paid workers are always looking for proper pay. Yeah. So it's quite natural. Actors should do the same, really, isn't it? Yeah. But I think that's the in Edinburgh especially, like it's an arts market and I think especially with this fringe people come here because even though you might lose a ton of money here you might get booked to do other work mm. so it's kind of what can you gain from you know ha what else is on offer besides mm. money and you really need to know that as well at least from an artist's perspective you need to know why you're coming here in the first place because that risk goal? is there like you can't get away from that um, in almost every fringe, really, you know, you can't get away from the possibility of potentially losing money. Um, but it's deciding whether that loss is then going to be actually a gain somewhere else, you know, so it's balancing up those options, I suppose, at least for us. Yeah, I don't want to, uh, who, yes, uh, can we get the microphone yes, up? Uh, Fourth, Fourth, Fourth row, we'll just get you a microphone. Oh, you're from uh, with, with yeah, Julianne. Yeah, this was me. No, my name is Peter Corbell. I'm with Capital Fringe. Uh, no, just very curious, just kind of a question for the artists. I'm um, kind of, what is your thought process behind when you think about attending a, a fringe, and mm. is is it often is it driven by uh, economics? Um, no. Or, or no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, which depends. fringe you mean? Exactly. Yeah. Like, for example, Edinburgh is not so much economics, it's more what else you can gain by being here. The people that see you, um, the career steps that you can take from being here, mm. because this is not about making money. But when we go to Australia, we make enough money to set us up for the whole year. Mm. So it's about what different fringes can bring you and why you're taking that work there. Like a lot of people come to Edinburgh with new work that's a bit experimental as yeah. well. Because um, they know they have an audience, but also could be out there ready to receive it. When we go to Australia, we take a, a show that we know that we can sell, and mm. that we we then we make really great money over there. So it sort of depends what yeah what the fringe is and what you can gain from doing that. And there are other options as well. Like you know, other artists would have different goals for doing different fringes. Whether it is just to go out and see a new country and travel to somewhere you haven't been before and hopefully make enough money to then, you know, live while you're out there. Like a lot of people we know do mm. that, go from country to country, um, just making enough to sort of survive. Whereas then another uh, option might be that you want to go and actually earn some money or you want to go there because you know that certain people will be there that you can, you know, market your show towards. But yeah, I guess it's something that, especially when we're talking to people that haven't done a fringe before, that's one of the key things that we say to people, that know why you're going. Know that you're not just going yeah. for a reason, know what those reasons are. Mm. Could I just maybe ask um, uh, uh, Cynthia and Chris to respond a bit more to, to Donovan's question about how you see the role of administrators in terms of balancing, uh, particularly, I suppose, in Taipei, with a kind of political uh, environment mm. and the organisation environment, how you empower artists and get that sense of freedom, because you know, you're, you're really the bridge or the pivot between the artists, mm -hmm. and, uh, and in, in Chris's case, more with the, the sponsorship angle. Yeah, Would you sure. like to respond yeah, to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can do that. Uh, as, uh, as for the political, it's not really that uh, uh, they, they are not really that get into our way. And also, uh, as an as a administrator, that uh, because I'm not an artist, but in our fringe, we have a, a curator. A curator is an artist. Uh, this is the, the, yeah, we have uh, the second one. And she, her role is not really to curate, uh, to curate programs, but it's also a bridge between like, like me and, uh, and the artist. Mm -hmm. So if there's uh, any question from the government or from, from, from us that we say, oh, well, better not to do that. And then the, the curator can go between that, uh, maybe negotiate to the artist about something. And also if there's artists, some, some request, she will pers persuade us that to accept that. So to us that uh, we have a, uh, it, I don't really think that government government has some issue, but uh, maybe like uh, 130 programs a year, and they have 
pro problem with one or two, and we can work out about that. We can maybe use different venues or like uh, uh, ask, us, ask them to have some kind of restrict, re restriction, so that's fine. And I also like to respond to the previous question uh, because in uh, because we also do Taipei uh, Arts Festival and Children's Arts Festival. In our two festivals, we use a lot of uh, programs from Fringe. Uh, we also have uh, so many uh, programs from Edinburgh Fringe, actually. So like this year uh, in Children's Arts Festival, there's a, a program called uh, White, which, uh, which was uh, in Edinburgh Fringe, made in Scotland program by Catherine Wheels company. And they, uh, they being uh, they that that was their first uh, performance uh, in of their company, but the the program was so successful that they've been touring around like so many different countries, and they've been to in Taipei, and then they're going to some other places, and they have a new production right now. So I was talking to them that uh, they say to be in French is so uh, much about to be uh, to be seen by other people. So if you get like a uh, like stars from the fringe or awards from fringe, that is, that's a, that's a big thing for the company. So I I, re I do really believe that because in Taipei in Taipei Arts Festival, we also have so many programs. Almost every year, at least one one programs from the Edinburgh Fringe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess the. Um, Hmm. The, the big thing, I guess, is that uh, the most important thing, and I talked about this sort of like when we were dating, we were trying to find the right partner for us. The Fringe has had, like Dublin Fringe has had a history of, of title sponsorship, and that's, that's a history that exists in Ireland as well. Like before we were the absolute Fringe, uh, you might remember us from the, like, the pink days, the, the very like, that, that was for four years. It was a three-year partnership that they turned into four. Uh, and that really fueled our like that really fueled the work. It allowed the programming team to. Uh, there was a nice dynamic between the company and the festival, saying we want to try this thing of doing a fringe club. Would you help us kind of power that and make that happen? So there was a there was a synergy around making making the ideas happen around around the company. And before then, it was ESB, which is a bank. Uh, and then the Dublin Theatre Festival was sponsored for a long time by Ulster Bank. Mm. So. One, the fact that it exists in, in the sphere makes it different than if it didn't, I guess. And the, th the thing I think, like, when we were, so when we were dating, uh, the thing that we did was, in all of those conversations, we made sure that there was never a question around the program, that that was, like, the, where the line was. So, uh, yeah, sure, we make sure that Tiger Beer is the beer at the festival, everywhere at the festival, everywhere you go. Um, but it's not about it, for 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 us. It's the 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 connection with the company isn't about the art. It's about the audience. They want T Tiger Beer is a Singaporean brand. They they're trying to break into the market in Ireland. They want to connect with our audience. They feel like they've got a match with what who our audiences are. Uh, and and the company actually has a history of supporting arts around the world, specifically more in larger cities. Uh, so. For, for us, because they had that cred, they had that history of doing happenings, doing arts events, supporting street art, like lots of different kinds of things. It was like, okay, they're, they're real. Like they, we, can, we can talk to them about getting behind a festival where, you know, in the festival this year, we, there's, there's artists who are challenging Ireland's abortion laws, who are challenging the, the laws around same-sex marriage, who are talking about, uh, who are putting very queer bodies on stage, for hours with chainsaws in, in like a choreographic experiment. Oh, will... make sure you book that one. <laughs> Page 124. Uh, like, like that, they have to be there. They have to be behind that. And yeah. there's sort of no question that that, that, that is the, like that's the terrain. Well, yeah. that's, I mean, that's you, our thing. you wouldn't do it if there was a question. Well, no, right? right. Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You couldn't. Yeah, you'd, you you'd feel like that. you'd sold your... Yeah, mm. I mean, that wouldn't work. No, and, <laughs> and our audience is way too smart. Our audiences are way too sophisticated. To, to, to they'll, like they'll smell it on it a mile away, and I think that's true of any city, mm -hmm. and any kind of art context, especially when they're when it's, I know a group of people who are attracted to the idea that there's a community of really different voices and really different artists who are all come and audiences who are all coming together 
to experience this thing called a fringe. Like that, they're the most discerning, almost, mm -hmm. you know? I've got one question, which actually can be for the room as well as the, the panel, which is, is really, it goes back to your point about spirit of innovation and, and so on, uh, Chris, which is that, you know, the whole digital, um, it's a cliche, but the digital revolution um, and, and the increasing use of technology in certain shows. Uh, if I saw uh, one at the Travers the, the other day, which is hardly a fringe venue, but anyway, it's not in the International Festival. Um, and the, 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 as it were, the um, issue between that and artists wanting to use much more, or some artists wanting to use much more in the digital world and uh, technology, and, this, and the um, exigencies of the quick turnover, the fact that the shows have to be an hour, you get half an hour turnaround and so on. Is this a, is this a constriction actually helping? In some ways, restrictions can be fertile for, for creativity, but is it sort of hampering the development of new form and new ideas? The fact that you've got to be in at 10, out at 5 to 11, you have half an hour set up time for the next thing. How do, how do we balance that need for innovation with the fact that they've got to put six shows on in a day? I think it's a real hindrance. And I probably wouldn't have said that a couple years ago, but I actually think a lot of what we've heard from people who are performing or working on shows in our festival is that they'd actually, like the tech folks would actually like to be part of the festival too. <laughs> you know, they'd actually like to be able to do something yeah. <laughs> besides get in and out in 15 minutes. And so a lot of what we're gonna try to do is maybe figure that out for next year um, and figure out how to keep it a level playing field but because it's also like if you do a show that's very physical and you need to have a fight call before the show yeah like you can't do that either mm. um, so it tends to sort of you it, it, it damages the ability to be subtle or inventive in mm. some ways I think no or not so I mean I'm just throwing it out there I, I don't think so I think there's I think there's a um, there are a lot of artists, and there are a lot of artists in this festival who have managed to uh, uh, stretch it as far as you can go, and and be as nuanced and as delicate. Mm. Like there's no, uh, I wouldn't have the question around nuance and, and delicacy. For sure, there's the thing, there's the feeling of like the difference of sitting in a venue in a two-day get-in, mm -hmm. and then opening on the third day, uh, or sitting in a venue when you're in there for 20 minutes. But I think that all of the successes that we, you see can attest to how smart that the field is around the world in terms of technicians and artists um, but I'd be really curious to hear from you two like are there things you've cut or things you wouldn't wouldn't do because you can't get it into five five different kinds of Spiegel tones well the giant choreographed dance number we have in the middle kind of got screwed up but uh, no I mean this, <laughs> no um, <laughs> this is the thing like I mean because we've uh, made our shows to fit that kind of model. Um, it means that yes, we have to rethink our sort of giant ideas. Any form of huge set or prop or anything like that is can be a little bit difficult. And the tech thing is actually a very salient point. Like it's hard to make sure that your show is ready at a professional level mm -hmm. when you don't have a lot of time to even have a proper sound check sometimes. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the challenges and one of the hindrances, but one of the exciting things about Fringe, I yeah. suppose. It's a thing that we all know about. Just forces you to be a bit more creative in, mm. in how well, you're going to get yeah, ready. Yeah. yeah, and also, um, I guess because we do, you know, we know that our show is a Fringe show, so we, we kind of fit that into that context. It's easily tourable. It's not, mm. you know, whereas if we were in a space for a month, we would It'd do different. something different. But I think also, yeah, I think you, you have to enter into the spirit of Fringe in that way and just go, great, we've got 15 minutes, let's just what everyone get in, yeah. move the stuff and have a really <laughs> choreographed routine of who moves what and puts it where. And you learn to be really, really fast, yeah. really yeah. fast. But, I mean, yeah, this is a thing that you, I guess you do have to think about before we start. Other, other comments? You've been very quiet on the... Uh, oh, yeah, OK. I've got a question about... Like, who, 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 just say oh, who you sorry. are. I've got the mic as well. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm Holly Lombardo from World Fringe. I'm uh, just thinking about mainstream, and actually, surely we need to define what mainstream is before we can ask the question if fringe is mainstream or not, because there would be so many aspects of fringe that could be mainstream. Like in Edinburgh, there are pockets of mainstream here, the comedy, 
the comedy section, quite a lot of that is mainstream. Other fringes might pad out their programme with some off the shelf at the Theatre Royal, for instance. Or is it, or is fringe uh, mainstream because there's so many of them now? I mean, there's, no, there's like 230. Is that what you mean by it becoming mainstream because it's a popular sector? Or are we talking about the performances within the fringe making it mainstream? Okay, Just thanks. Let's take that and then. Uh, Lady up there, let's see if you can pass the mic over and take that one as well. No, We've got about 10 minutes, so if you've got a question, ask it now so we can mm -hmm. take these different. I guess when we're can talking. Oh, sorry, my name is Kathy Novakis. I'm from Canada, the Canadian Association of Fringe Festivals. Oh, wow. One of the questions that. Um, recur when when we're or when I'm talking about mainstream is in particular the the Western model of theater which is very much fringe um, you know you have a stage you have a set time to perform I guess what I'm grappling with and what I think we need to be thinking about is does that model work anymore Mm. And, and that's what I'm really, you know, grappling with because in particular when you get into different kinds of cultural communities, what we do in Fringe doesn't fit and technology fits into that, other, you know, ethnic minorities and, and, and that's where personally I think we're kind of struggling in some ways in Canada because of the uh, native, uh, like the Aboriginal populations, you don't see them performing at Fringe. Mm. It's not a model that works. Yeah. So I'm, uh, that to me is, is the question about mainstream. Yeah. <coughs> Just throwing that out there. Any, no, but any, oh, there's a lady up at the back. If you could, oh. uh, this is another, there must be another <laughs> growing <laughs> idea. <laughs> Thank you. For that. We'll take all these together. So as um, as hills, I'm done. <laughs> uh, Kia ora, I'm Hannah from the New Zealand Fringe Festival. From Hannah. Hannah Clark from the New Zealand Fringe Festival. And uh, this is something that uh, that I think about quite regularly is the mainstream and, and what it is that fringes are presenting throughout the world. And I feel that actually as a fringe festival, we have a responsibility to challenge our artists to take risks and to not create mainstream works, to not take the safe path of putting themselves in a theatre, putting on a 60-minute performance, but to actually think about where what, what it is they're doing and why they're doing it and, and to really push themselves and their art form to look outside and to actually, you know, we as Fringe Festivals create a platform and invite audiences along but for, for our artists to use that to their advantage to take risks and to take that mainstream-ish audience on a journey with them outside of the mainstream. Thank you I for that. that. I that there's a little <laughs> selfie number going on up here. Yes, it's very good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's take those. Oh, is this, were you putting your hand up? There's, there's one more, and then we'll try and take those because uh, they're quite linked, actually, in many ways. Uh, I'm, I'm Mike Marinacci. I'm the festival producer of Orlando Fringe. Um, I actually, I, 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 from a different perspective, obviously, from in the arts world, mainstream means the Shakespeare theater, the ballet, the opera. Uh, but I think Fringe is more mainstream than uh, the traditional arts world because we are a grassroots organization. We have far more support from the grassroots than uh, traditional arts organizations. So I think um, in, in that regard, we're more connected to uh, and, and representative of the actual population of a, 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 a city than what's traditionally called the mainstream in the arts world. Thank you for that observation. Yeah. Um, any other one more comment or that should we take okay let's take the let's take yeah I'm just trying to f contextualize those for a response I mean uh, for the response for the, from my friends here um, the definitions I mean I, I my take it on it is that almost uh, um, uh, picking up, up Kathy's point it, it depends what kind of society and community you live in as to what fringe and mainstream means so it'll be very different in Toronto from what it is in, in, in Taipei or indeed uh, Joburg or wherever we might be. Um, so in, in many ways those terms are helpful because they're very malleable. Um, uh, I think the question about does the Western model work for non-Western work in the fringe is a very interesting one. Is it driving it towards a more formulaic way well, of keeping it in this, in this model? What ideas are there for, for breaking out of that? Um, and um, 
Uh, and and uh, that picks up as well the idea of, of, of challenging artists to take risks when you've got to give them the space to take risks in that sense. Mm -hmm. You can't challenge them to take risks and then say, well, you've got to fit into this precise box, mm -hmm. or maybe you can. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What about some, some reflections on those four very good interventions? Who wants to go first? Why didn't Julianne, why didn't you go I was first? really thinking about that Western model thing. Uh, you know, it, it sort of made me think about why we started doing our site-specific program, mm -hmm. uh, which we did six things this year. A lot of them were just out on the street. One of them uh, we gave an entire building to uh, just to sort of see what this group would do. And it was okay. It wasn't that great, but it was pretty cool to give someone a building. <laughs> uh, but a, a lot of it was to sort of, you know, that we, with our, we call them fringe-run venues. Uh, it's very formulaic, the way that we engage with the artists. Uh, and just, I, you know, when I first started thinking about what mainstream was, I, wasn't act I was thinking something different. Uh, and now I, I always think that the way that we create the best festival experience is that we treat our artists and audiences the same way. And I think if we're challenging our audiences to take all these risks and do all these different things, then maybe we need to sort of think about our artists as well in that and think about how we're engaging with them and not just slapping them with a formulaic form and like just fit in our little box mm. and do it. So it's, I, yeah, awesome. That's cool. It's making me think about something yeah, in a well, different good. way. You think so that's good. <laughs> that's good. Thanks. We've only got about three or four more minutes. So if you've got observations on, on those four areas or three questions, Cynthia, of something. Quick. Yeah, yeah. You can always, you've got time in the breakouts, I think, yeah. to follow these up. So we don't have to cram everything in. Right. Uh, I think the fringe that uh, uh, for, it's, it's a platform for artists. So to us, uh, for, but not for artists, it's for everybody. Because we have so many different, different groups that uh, they are like a mother's group or they are like a, a work people, but they, 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 they done something there and it's great. So I think for the mainstream, I kind of agree with that, that uh, mainstream is for, because the, the fringe is for everybody. So we, we just, uh, our, our role is to help artists to do whatever they want. Uh, although there's a, there's a little box that they, you, you cannot go, go out of that, but uh, we think that box that you can do whatever you want and then we are, we, we are there to help you. That's what we, our role, yeah. Chris? Uh, I, I guess that the thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, like the idea of fringe. Uh, like if I hear, uh, so for example, our fringe started uh, 20 years ago when uh, Irish artists were sick of not being in the Dublin Theatre Festival and then they, they made their own festival. And it was on during the festival, so it was the, it was the actual off or the actual fringe. And then uh, in 2003 or four, uh, Wolfgang Hoffman was the director and he moved the oh, festival. Yeah. So we were outside of the theatre festival, which was great for venues and mm. uh, terrible for technicians because they basically have eight weeks of their, mid, all the eight weeks of their year, like kind of right back to back. But they get paid though. But they get paid, yeah, yeah, <laughs> very well. <laughs> and they're very good. But, uh, but we're not really a fringe anymore because we're not actually happening on the fringes That's of the good. Dublin Theatre Festival. We're actually kind of bigger and, and sometimes we take more attention, get more attention and, you know, th th there's a, we're not funded at the same level, but we're kind of, you know, we're, we, uh, we could be competing for work, often, local and international work. So we're not really a fringe anymore, and it's curated, so it's not the open model of a fringe that, that is usually a fringe. Uh, and if I, like if I listen to you, Julianne, you, you, you saying, you know, you created the fringe, making it the festival now, and I wonder if in five or ten years it'll be the Capital Arts Festival or it'll be the Washington Arts Festival, because you're not a fr you're like you're the fringe of the city in the sense, but, it, but as your momentum grows, I, I, I kind of imagine this kind of, like, no. really, you need fringe anymore, you know? Well, we'll, well see. We'll I mean, it's a journey, right? We're on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is like the community tells you what yeah. to do, yeah. you know? Like, that's who guides, yeah. that's who guides it. Yeah. Mm. Final word from the... Yeah, I mean, I guess the idea of uh, fringe artists being kind of... Uh, given those boundaries by a fringe festival is something that I guess I hope in an idealistic artistic way that doesn't really happen like fringes are going to constantly be redefined even as big as they get and even as potentially mainstream as they get there's still going to be you guys who will give us 
something like a, a platform to do whatever the hell we want to do um, as long as it kind of makes a vague sense on some sort of playing field somewhere <laughs> you know like I haven't been to a fringe festival where I've not heard of a performance that is slightly out there that there is something a bizarre opera that's happening on the beach or somebody that's doing a one-man performance in a phone booth to somebody something that doesn't fit the standard sort of model of sitting in a theater for 60 minutes on a stage with an audience. I, I, I hope that if an artist came to any one of you with a pretty odd idea that had something interesting about it, that you would give them the chance to maybe explore that at your Fringe Festival, even if it didn't quite fit those parameters. I mean, that's kind of the point, isn't it? Yeah. I, I was going to actually ask Kath, uh, before we close, if you had any observation, will you come back later? Because I felt I was going to ask you and then I, Strangely forgot. I have, I have lots of observations. I'm thinking a lot about it now. I probably haven't got enough. I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's difficult because, as you said, or, or perhaps it's easier because those definitions are, are slightly malleable. You know, fringe means, as you say, Chris, fringe is different, means something different to lots of different people. Mainstream clearly means something different. Mm. I'm, I'm kind of with you, Mike. I think, I think if it's really popular and everybody really loves it and everybody feels that they own it, that probably means it's mainstream and that's probably a good thing. Perhaps, and I think maybe Julianne, you'll have maybe you will be Capital Arts Festival in ten years, and then somebody else will arrive from Philly, and they'll make a fringe, and you know, <laughs> so it will continue. And yeah, yeah. yeah. so well, no, actually, Graham, no, co no coherent observations. No coherent clearly, observations. <laughs> that's very good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're in charge here. That's great. <laughs> um, no, I, I just I've really enjoyed the discussion. I hope, I hope you have. I, I just I'm impressed as something of an outsider with this because I don't manage a fringe festival. Um, the, the, you know, it's it's it. I can sense the 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 balances and the choices that you have to make between um, you know maintaining that spirit and, and adventure of, of what a fringe should be, uh, what, however you define it, whilst trying to mitigate all those. Uh, Risks on behalf of the artists because you're giving them a, a young art, young, mostly younger artist, to, to find a platform uh, for them to reach an audience and reach some more artistic potential. At the same time, beating off the the kind of bureaucrats and the sponsors who may have unreasonable demands. Some of them may be very reasonable. So it's, you you're 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 in a very uh, even whether your festival's curated or not. You're in a very um, important and significant position. I think meeting like this can only be good. And the fact that the sector can maintain that kind of spirit of adventure and innovation whilst becoming more businesslike, I think, is is, a, is 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 very impressive. And I, I'd like to congratulate. I haven't visited all these places yet, but I wouldn't mind. I'm not doing badly at British Council. I'm getting around the world, so I must try and come and visit <laughs> visit some. I may miss out Milton Keynes. No, it's right. Oh. No, no, <laughs> no. That was a cheap, cheap jive. I love Milton Keynes. Do you want, do you want to... No, no, I love it. Who's from Milton Keynes? I apologise. We're used to it. Um, <laughs> increase their funding. Oh, I'll, 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 yes. Okay, no, I, I'm only joking. But thank you, thank you to the panel for a very stimulating uh, discussion, and thank you for being such an attentive audience. Thank you. And on uh, behalf of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society, we'd very much like to thank you as well for your cheering. Nice. It's a wonderful job anytime you do it for us, so much appreciated. Nice. We're going to go outside and have a coffee in a moment, uh, but we have a tiny little film clip that we're going to show oh, yeah. you. It's from our sponsors, Donovan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really. Um, <laughs> can't wait for that session with you. <laughs> Melbourne Fringe, sorry we can't make it to the Congress this year, festival runs from the 17th of September to the 5th of October. Have a great Congress. Bye. 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 Aloha. Hi, my name is Misa. I am the organizer for the Oahu Fringe Festival here in Honolulu, Hawaii. I am standing wow. right outside Chinatown. In fact, I'm at the Arts and Mars Garage one of the venues that we will be using for our French. From us here in Honolulu, Hawaii, I want to wish everyone the very best at the World French Congress. May it go well, I'm sure it will, and I hope this small message goes a long way to helping you guys uh, discuss really, really important issues regarding French worldwide. 
And then I want to catch up with you guys via Skype and maybe maybe also online sometime in the future. Come see us here. I wish you guys all the very best. Aloha. <laughs> and, and that's all we have there was actually a message from Adam from Stockholm as well but the file that he sent was corrupted but just to let you know he did make the effort uh, so um, outside there's teas and coffees uh, we start our breakout sessions at 12 o'clock I'm sure any of the World Fringe Congress staff will be able to get you in the right direction so you know where you're going thank you very much